Warren Jess was serving as accomplice. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Warren Jeffs was serving as FLDS prophet when he was arrested in Texas. He was convicted of marrying underage women polygamously and is currently serving time in a Texas prison. Historian Lindsay Hansen Park has strong words for the LDS Church for marginalizing the FLDS Church so much and making Warren Jeffs possible. Is that a fair charge? We'll talk about that in our next conversation. But first, I wanted to mention some exciting new information. As you know, we're part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, and we've teamed up with a new platform called Lyceum.fm. That's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M. And so if you want to listen to all the amazing podcasts on the Dialogue Podcast Network, go ahead and sign up to them. Now, Lyceum has some great podcasts, including Freakonomics, History of the Bible, and lots of other amazing podcasts. If you want a single feed to listen to all the best Mormon-themed podcasts, download the Lyceum app on your phone. Podcasts include the Mormon News Report, Dialogue, and of course, your favorite Gospel Tangents. Um, So to support the Dialogue Podcast Network, become a member for just $5 a month. Members will get exclusive episodes and a chance to discuss and engage this show with me and my other listeners. So go to the App Store or Google Play, download Lyceum, and become a member of the Dialogue Podcast Network today. That's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M. So we're excited to be part of that. Now back to our conversation. I've changed. I hated polygamy when I started the podcast. I hated it. LDS women are super screwed up because we're taught that it's weird and wicked and gross and like hear are all the terrible horror stories on, you know, documentaries and stuff, but like that's going to be in heaven. And so your brain is like, I don't want to go to heaven. I don't know how to make sense of this. Yeah. like That's why I, you want to go to the terrestrial kingdom, huh? Oh yeah. That's, that's one of the reasons. I'm not celestial material. Um, and it's not even about, I think I've matured enough now to realize that like consensual polyamorous relationships great people that's what makes people happy people are interesting they have different needs fine i think mormon monogamy and mormon mormon polygamy are the same they're the same in function they're the same in purpose they're the same in penalties they're the same and you have the same problem show up in mormon monogamy that you have in polygamy and the majority of the people that are in pain in these communities they're not really directly in pain because of polygamy. And that polygamy marginalized them. It made them off the grid. It gave their leaders more power and control because they were underground and it was sort of dark and secretive. But, like, most people, when they get out, they're not like, oh, you know, having five mothers ruined my life. They love their mothers. That was a positive experience. Like, if you had a bad mom, you had four other options. It wasn't a bad thing. It's the abuse, it's the coercion, it's the penalties involved with polygamy. If you don't do this, if you don't sign up for this, then then this will happen. We have the same culture with Mormon missions, with 19-year-old boys who, like, we say they choose to go on a mission, but if you don't choose, it's a really different path. You're bringing shame on, upon your family. Plural marriage is very similar in function. Now, that is to say there are assigned marriages. There are terrible things that come out of underage and assigned marriages. But you can also talk to people who were married at 14 and 15 who were adamant believers in this. And I don't agree with it. It's not the life that I would choose. I think it's coercive. I think it's absolutely abusive. But I refuse to... I, I can't in good conscience sit here as an LDS person and be like, oh yeah, that's so bad, why would you do that? And then still participate in the stuff that happens in our own culture. The Mormon, the missionary culture, the shaming, the, the, the way, the whole discourse we have around Mormon marriage. I mean, that was, in my own personal experience, I started out this podcast because I was so angry about polygamy. But I was really angry about my own marriage. I was married to a nice guy that I chose, but I didn't really choose. It, all the choices had been made before me, and I couldn't make sense of why I was unhappy. I'd done everything right, and I couldn't make sense to why I was unhappy. And I realized after I sort of slowed down the podcast, like, oh, gosh, like this was never about pulling me. This is about me. <laughs> this is about my issues. And I let my trauma and my pain spill out onto all these communities, and there's something irresponsible about that. And so I've tried to be, I've tried to recognize that, and I, 
I just sort of resent this LDS attitude where we're like, yeah, they're so gross. We should feel so bad for them. We have the same amount of hidden abuse in our communities. We have the same amount of um, trauma. Mormonism, I think, in a lived experience, Brighamite Mormonism is on a spectrum. And you can find fundamentalists who had a beautiful, wonderful, enriching experience that it just shaped them and made them who they are, in or out of the church, whether they stay or go. And then you have people that had terrible, awful, dark experiences. And you can say the same thing about LDS people. We're all on a different spectrum. And some people will have the parents that are the crazy Orthodox people that don't let their kids play on Sunday or wear secular clothes or play. Like, you know, I talked to an LDS woman the other day who she wasn't allowed to play with kids that, you know, kids at all. She wasn't allowed to have play dates. Family first. Those were her LDS interpretations, her parents' interpretation of the gospel. Same thing in Mormon fundamentalism. And yet we want to just keep positioning ourselves as higher, as better. And we're not. Our problems are the same. Our culture is the same. Our theology is the same. You can argue that Warren Jeffs stepped it up, and I think that that is true. In the last 20 years, he has taken the FLDS specifically and sort of really made his own trauma spill out onto that community, right? But for the most part, his is theologically sound in, in the sense that any other interpretation of Mormonism is as theologically sound as Warren Jeffs. You take a source material and you argue the interpretation, and who's to say otherwise? And so for me, that's what, that's what this history does, is it shows us, like, oh, we're not removed from that at all. Like, we want to be. Polygamy is so prevalent in Utah. You know polygamists. I know polygamists. They're everywhere. They are living amongst us. They're sending their kids to BYU. They're sending their kids to get married in the temple. Um, does that still happen? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Dub people who are double dipping all the time. You know, and I, I've, I've, I've asked a few people this, and I'm, I'm curious your opinion. You know, we've had the, the gay policy where children of, of gays couldn't be uh, baptized or, or ordained. And they've always, the justification was, well, that's how we've always treated the polygamists, which I think until this policy came out, I don't think anybody knew but that's how we treated polygamists. <laughs> well, I did, yeah. and they did. But the majority of, I mean, probably people on my podcast, because I've asked this question a few times, but um, we still, they're still under this exclusion policy. Oh, yeah. And when it came out, and that was the justification, I remember there was a collective sigh of relief from LDS people. They'd be like, oh, that's right. We do it to polygamists, so it must, must be fine. They have no idea the impact that this has on families. I have heard story after story after story of how this separates family. The LDS Church says it's about family, but they're asking children who have an earnest desire to convert to the LDS Church to go on a mission to serve the, the Lord in the best way that they know how. They're asked to deny their parents. And for what? A doctrine that is still on our books? I mean, Spencer Kimball, Spencer W. Woolley Kimball, he got sealed to his cousin as a prophet, he had his wife stand in his proxy. His cousin had passed away, and she stood in. His wife stood in as proxy to seal him to his dead cousin. Our, we have because Nelson. Because she didn't have an our, opportunity to marry? Is that why? Yes. And when, what, what year approximately? Oh, I'm I want to say, I could have this. I'm, all the dates are gone for me. So if, if I've gotten the 80s, dates wrong, everyone look it up. There's truth. There's a basis of truth in everything I'm saying, but look at the dates. 70s, maybe. Um, our own leader, our president, Nelson, is spiritually a polygamist. I know everyone says that, and it's kind of like, huh. Well, he's, a, he's a serial monogamist, right? It's on our books. It's in our theology. We have the three degrees in, in the kingdom. Like, why are we, like, treating people this way when it's in our doctrine? It doesn't make sense, except for you know the very like checkered history of it. But like I'll, it's so inconsistent too. And I'll, I'll give you an example. This is not my story to tell, so I'm going to talk about one family who have been public about it, the Browns, mm -hmm. you know, the Cody sister Brown. wives, Cody Brown. And then there are two other prominent plural families, one from the AUB, which is Cody Brown's tradition, and an independent group. They all have children that have gone on missions or wanted to convert. And the LDS Church has treated each differently. So... Cody Brown, what happened when his... Uh, Madison. Yes, wanted to go on a mission, wanted to convert, was denied. 
that is not the consistent case with the other families. In fact, their boy, uh, gosh, I, I've lost count. There are so many families, and I'm talking over 50 that I, that I just know about, who their kids are coming home from LDS missions in the last two years. Like, it's just, it's so inconsistent. It's so arbitrary. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. And here's my indictment of the LDS people and the LDS church. We are responsible for men like Warren Jeffs. I think we are complicit at the very least and at the, at the very worst responsible for men like that because what we did is we allowed, we allowed something to be so marginalized and to turn the other way because we didn't want to see how it reflected on us. We can't make the church look bad. We've got to protect the integrity of the church. So we're going to ignore what's happening down there and we're going to make it illegal so Warren Jeffs can say, you know what, you're being molested by your, your father or your brother. You can't report it to police because if you do, your whole family's going to go to jail. We can't trust any outsiders because even the LDS, like, they are out to get us. See, but I'm going to push back a little bit on that. I mean, if Warren Jeffs is a bad guy, okay, he's a bad guy. Don't we believe in being punished for our own sins? How, how, how do you try to justify that the LDS church is responsible for that because the other I mean tying this back to the policy um, you know part of the justification was well the polygamists basically say well go join the LDS church go on a mission get married in the temple and then come back to us and we'll teach you the higher law so I mean I don't like this policy I don't like it but I can understand if that's what the polygamists are saying, oh, go join the LDS church and then come back to us. Yeah. I can understand why the church would be would have a problem with that. Of course. So, so how do we then say, well, okay, now the LDS church is responsible for Warren Jeffs? Oh, uh, well, so Warren, the FLDS is different. They're not taking converts. Warren Jeffs has cut it off. But you have to understand, first of all, Rule and Jeffs, who shaped Warren Jeffs was completely shaped by LDS culture, theology, and doctrine. He, he planned his whole church and organizational structure as a reaction to LDS treatment of him personally and systemically. So there's a whole history here. So he had his own trauma because, I mean, you're saying that Warren grew up LDS? Is that what you're saying? No, Rulin, his father did. Rulin grew up. And so that trauma that Rulin then transferred to Warren? But that's too simplistic, but that's part of it I too. Mean, what it is is, here's what it is. Warren Jeffs was a, he's a horrific, he's committed horrific acts. Horrific. I've had to get therapy for some of the work that I've had to do. I, was, I did not anticipate being involved with some of the most heinous interpretations of Mormonism. I mean, this guy has twisted what I think is, my personal opinion well, if is. these are heinous interpretations, how can you then say that, that this is a legitimate theology? And how can you say what do we t what do, who, who gets to decide what's legitimate theology and what's not? If Mormonism is open to interpretation, we have no like we have no process or canonized thing. We just decide Mormons can't LDS people can't even decide what if the proclamation, even if within the own apostles, if it's just a suggestion, if it's a revelation, if it's a policy, there is no process for this. So that's part of it. But Here's the thing, I get it, Warren Jeffs has done bad things, he makes us uncomfortable, but our response to the FLDS people empowered men like him. Warren Jeffs couldn't even get a conviction in Utah. That's how, with all the evidence that they had, they had a tape of him raping a 12-year-old daughter, he had it, or a girl, in his car. They had that evidence. They couldn't even bust him in Utah because we don't want to look at that. We don't want the we are so anymore. we have such collective shame about polygamy. We will do whatever we can to turn a, a blind eye. I cannot tell you. Like I get, I get super fired up about this because there are so many victims of like really heinous things in fundamentalism. They can't get police to take them seriously because the topic alone, once they know they're polygamous, makes people so uncomfortable. So uncomfortable. So we have, so it, it just allows men like Warren Jeffs to be like, that's right. They're not, they're going to stay away from us. We're so isolated. Uh, I can do whatever I want. And he did. And even still, it's so interesting. As the town has been changing, I've been witness to this. I've been up close and personal, seeing this town reclaim themselves, try to get healthy. The LDS church has been helping now for the first time. 
they're giving aid. There's there's a you know a food desert in Colorado City. There's poverty. It's it's like a developing country there. And all these churches stepped up. Do you think they want people to know about it? Absolutely not. They want it quiet, and they wanted it quiet for a long time. And I'm just like, why? Why why do we need to be quiet about it? Now they've bought property in the town. There's a huge land grab, and I'm yeah, kind of res- yes. And I'm resentful about it because I'm like, oh, all of a sudden now that it's sort of it's like cool to go down there. Now we can like show that we have a presence. And that's that's kind of petty and reductive. There's a mission president down there who, that area was part of his mission and he got really invested and he's done a lot of good work. So I don't want to denigrate what he has done, but I'm talking about collective attitudes. My attitude where I was, I thought I was better than them, where Mormons still think that they're better. Oh, we're not polygamists, we don't do that. That's something that they do. That attitude empowered Warren Jeffs. I think. I think we are complicit in that. We allowed a man like that to do those things to those people. And because of the stories that we inherited from our grandfathers and their grandfathers about who was right, whose priesthood was right, which practice is right, it's allowed him to just go crazy with okay, the so sickness. Us, so us turning our backs on them yes. essentially is, 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 is what yes, you're, you're and Yes, and still today, I mean, like... So there's this one thing of like this institutional shame that we have with polygamy, which I think is a huge problem. I mean, just even still, you go into any Mormon space. I, I encounter this daily. I'll be like, you know, the FLDS, first thing I always hear, well, he's not like us. He's not LDS. They're different. They're different. And it's like, right, but we're talking about child rape. Like, why aren't we talking about child rape? Why is your first reaction to a story about Warren Jeffs be like, but he's not LDS? Do you understand? Like, that's my resentment. It's like, why isn't our first thing to, like, there's this horrible abuse going on. Let's be shocked about that. But the first knee-jerk reaction to every faithful LDS person always is loyalty to the institution first. That's not us. That's not us. Yeah, that's terrible. It's not us, though. And I just think that, that is the attitude responsible for empowering someone like that. That's, that is sort of my indictment against this culture. As long as we continue to think that we're better than them, we somehow have better authority or we're the one true church or they went off the rails, like, then I think we're responsible in their suffering. I really do. And those are strong words, but I have tried to get victims help. I have tried to get people support. And people, I have, I have family members who are embarrassed about what I do. Like, I'm a sh- I've brought shame to my family because of the work that I do because I'm talking about polygamy we don't, you don't do that as an LDS person. We don't even want that associated with us. And now here I am shining a light and saying, actually, we're way more similar than I thought we were. LDS people are like, no, 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 no. Get that away from me. We're not like that. I don't want to confront it because it's such a painful, complicated thing in our theology that's still there but not there. And that's why Carolyn P- Pearson calls it the ghost of eternal polygamy. It's there all the time. It's present all the time. It's, it's in our hymn books. It's in our theology. It's in our history. And our policies are shaped around polygamous policies. And we're all organizing around polygamy every single day, but we don't want to acknowledge it. And to me, that's, that's the sin. I think that that's the... And, and I'm, I'm not blaming anyone directly. I don't know how they could have handled this. Such a messy thing. Such a painful thing. But my goodness, it's not far from us at all, you know? Polygamy is just such a part of everything. Mormonism is just, LDS Mormonism is just, uh, we're organizing polygamy all the time, around it all the time, to try to not be polygamous, right? So we try to change DNC 132 to like, oh, it means celestial marriage means monogamy now, <laughs> all of a sudden. And, and Brian Hales will argue that, and he's right, historically, there has been a concerted effort uh, since the 50s to change plural doctrine to monogamy. So he's right about that. Uh, But it's still there. It's still in our temples. It's still in our heaven. It's still in our hell. It's still in our practices, culture, and policy. And so I don't think our church will ever get healthy until we are able to all like collectively stand up and look in the mirror. And it can't happen if we are continuing to judge people that have lived it and survived it honestly because they were just doing what their grandfathers did and we are just doing what our grandfathers did right and so that's a, a lot of the work that I do now is to try to bring people together 
I'm not interested in getting people in or out of the church or to be a polygamist or not to be a polygamist. I think people get to decide that for themselves, you know? I think we've had too much in our life telling us how, what to do and how to think and what that looks like. And I'm more interested in having people get together and figure out, like, where the healing needs to happen on an individual level. And I'm telling you, if you are a Mormon scholar or historian or social worker or whatever, you need to be looking at these communities because they have answers and they figure out problems or answers to problems that we haven't figured out yet. And we should be learning from them. But even still, I'll go to, to Mormon Hist History Association, Mormon History Asso Historical Association. We don't want to acknowledge that. I brought up Warren Jeffs once, and Jan Ships rolled her eyes at me. She's like, well, we're not like that. So it's a problem. I think it's a problem. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with polygamy expert Lindsay Hansen Park. Our next conversation with her is going to be our last, so it's only going to be available to newsletter subscribers. So if you don't want to miss this episode, sign up today at uh, gospeltangents.com slash newsletter. Lindsay's going to give us a critique of ex-Mormons, and she says that they actually sustain LDS leadership. Here's the thing, this is the, back to my critique with ex-Mormons. I always say, guys, like, ex-Mormons watch conference more religiously than, like, faithful Mormons do. They'll watch it and they'll give you a play-by-play -play and they'll be like, can you believe that Elder Holland said this? And then they'll all rant about it. And I'm like, guys, like, you're still sustaining the brethren. You just don't <laughs> agree with them. That's the difference. Like, you're still upholding their authority. They still matter to you. And that's okay. Like, we need to stop being ashamed of that. Of course they impact our, our lives. Of course things that they say are going to affect you and your family. Like, why are we so afraid to admit that? If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruption. If you'd like a paperback version of our transcripts, go to amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview. Also, if you'd like to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website and I'll be able to send you a transcript as soon as they are completed and click the subscribe button. You can also find our latest information on facebook.com slash gospel tangents, as well as we're on Twitter at gospel tangents. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The link is at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents, and you can subscribe there. Also, please give us a five-star review. If you want to support all of the podcasts as part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, go to lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M, and do a search for Dialogue Podcast Network or Gospel Tangents, because, you know, that's a pretty cool one, too. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.